Welcome back to Hobby Basics. I'll be your instructor, Dana Howell, and today we're going to be covering the absolute fundamentals of how to put paint onto your models. We're going to start with Zenithal priming, and then we're going to go into how to mix some paint, how to use our brushes, dry brushing, washes, layering, and then a little bit of edge highlighting and other little things I might think of along the way. Hobby Basics is an online video series geared towards teaching you the basics of the miniature painting hobby in the format of a college level art class, giving you knowledge, demonstrations, as well as assignments to practice your skills between classes. If this is your first time watching, I'd like to make it clear that Black Lives Matter and I don't tolerate fascists within our hobby. Also, if this is your first class, I would encourage you to start at the beginning, as each class uses tools and builds upon concepts established in the previous ones. If you're watching this in 2020 on YouTube, I'll be linking the full playlist for the class up here, as well as down in the description. With that out of the way, let's begin. For today's class, you're going to need the following supplies. At the time of this video, this should cost you about $30 USD or $40 in Canadian fun bucks. I provided links down in the description to any and all tools and supplies you might need, but if you already have some of these tools, or if you can get them cheaper somewhere else, such as a local hardware or hobby store, feel free to do so. In our last class, we learned how to file and assemble our models. If you did the homework, you should now have a number of models that are ready to paint. Today, we're gonna to be taking your assembled models and completing the following steps. Zenithal priming, applying some basic highlights with dry brushing, adding shadows with a wash, and applying further selective highlights by layering with our main brush. The first thing we're going to want to do is prime our model using a can of spray paint. Primer is different from regular acrylic paint in that it provides a tacky surface which sticks very strongly to plastic and will be much easier to put other acrylic paints on top of. Without a primer, our acrylic paint is going to chip off of the model really easily and may not adhere to the model at all. In some beginner guides, you may be encouraged to prime with a black primer. This is a valid option for beginners because it gives you some built-in shadows and you can sort of build up your tones from dark to light. In other guides, you might be encouraged to use a white primer as it makes all the colors on top of it look more vibrant. In this video, we're going to be using the secret third option, which is a gray primer. Just kidding. As most of you know, in Canada, it's against federal law to use a gray primer on any sort of plastic models. So instead, we're going to be using the morally superior as well as fully legal method of Zenithal priming. Quite simply, Zenithal priming is when you prime your model first in black, and then you spray from above using a white or gray paint, sometimes even both, in order to create a gradient of light on the model which simulates natural daylight. It's called Zenithal priming because its intention is to mimic the properties of light when the sun is at its zenith, or highest point in the sky. So our light is coming from up here and going down here. You can see here that this gives us a much better starting point than a simple white or black prime or the fully illegal gray prime. Now, a coward might ask, Is it really worth putting in all of this effort up front into underpainting and xenothal priming if we're just going to put other colors on top of it? Well, there are actually two very important reasons why we do this. The first reason is that all paint has a certain layer of transparency, meaning that it's going to show through whatever colors are underneath it. So for example, you can see here what it looks like when I paint a simple red paint over a black surface versus a white surface. So it's to our advantage to work with the paint rather than against it and have the surfaces underneath it reflect the lighting that we want to have on the eventual finished surface. The second reason is what I call When I went to school for animation, we would spend at least three days a week in life drawing class. We would draw from a live model using charcoal or other mediums, and there would always be a timer. Sometimes it would be a 30 minute pose, and sometimes it would be an hour pose. Sometimes it would be a shorter pose, such as a minute or even 30 seconds, 15 seconds. And one of the first rules that our teacher taught us is that we should always be using techniques which makes sure that our drawing is always done, no matter how much time we have to draw. So in the first five seconds of drawing, rather than drawing the eye or the hand or a single finger or something, we would draw the line of action. Then over the next 20 seconds, we might flesh out the gesture. In the next few seconds, we might add some volumes, check their proportions, 
And then if we get past a minute, we might start fleshing out the volumes more in detail, adding sort of things like uh, the shape of the head or a jawline, things like that. So no matter how much time we had to draw the model, we would always use the same techniques and at any stage during whenever the timer would run out, our drawing would still be done. So why, you might ask, is it important that my life drawing or my miniature painting, which is what you're here to talk about, is complete no matter how much time you have left on your timer? I think it's important because it reveals a fundamental truth of all work and all art, which is the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle states that typically, 80% of the results come from 20% of the causes. In other words, if you're working on a 10 hour project, only about two hours of that 10 hours are going to contain 80% of the desired result. While the remaining eight hours are likely to just be busy work, refinement, or details. So no matter what sort of project we're working on, if we can isolate what that essential 20% is ahead of time, we can get it done first, make sure our project actually works for what we're intending it to be, and then we can spend the rest of the 80% of our time just having fun and adding more details and things like that. When building a car, this might mean making sure the engine works and it actually has wheels that can turn and go. In game design, it might mean nailing down the core mechanics first and making sure the game is actually fun to play and actually works before creating graphical assets or background and story, things like that. When painting miniatures, I would argue that this essential 20% is the lighting. This can be the hardest thing to nail, and I think also the thing that's going to show through the most in your final painting. If you get it right, pretty much any colors you put on the model are going to look good. This method of painting is sometimes called underpainting or sketch style, in which we sketch out the basic values on the model before we put any sort of color onto it. And coming full circle to where we started, the first thing we're going to want to do to do this sort of sketch style is a Zenithal Prime. So like I said before, we're going to want to prime the model fully in black and then spray from above using our white primer. Let's talk specifics. You're going to need a well-ventilated area, such as a balcony, in my case, a fire escape, or a backyard, or hidden cave, or sacred grotto. You're also gonna need your two cans of spray paint in black and white. In this example, I'm using Army Painter Flat Black Primer and Army Painter Flat White Primer because these work the best for me. Although you can, of course, use any primer of your choosing, including v Vallejo, Citadel, uh, or even a primer from your hardware store. Just be sure that it's an acrylic based primer that is safe for use on plastics. Full disclosure, Army Painters provided me with a lot of free product to use in my videos, although these two primers I bought on my own because I wanted to compare which primers worked best for me. I bought several different primers for this video and I tested them all out ahead of time. What I found was that the Army Painter ones were a good midpoint between price, quality, and accessibility, meaning they're widely available. So I would say these are my top recommendation for primers, followed by Vallejo, Citadel, and then something that you could get at the hardware store. Once you have your well-ventilated space and your cans of primer, you're going to need something to spray against. In this case, I'm using an old wooden canvas that I had lying around, but you could use a cardboard box, um, newspaper, whatever you have lying around that's going to cover things up. I have also chosen to mount the figures on blocks of woods using poster putty. Although this is an optional step and you could simply spray them in your hands while wearing rubber gloves, use double-sided tape to secure them to a piece of cardboard, or whatever other method you might choose. When you're ready to begin, shake up your can of black spray paint thoroughly, and holding the can about a foot away from your models, spray it back and forth in short, quick strokes. At no point during your spraying should the can be staying still, and with a little bit of practice, this should allow you to get a nice even coat on each of the models. While spraying, make sure you're taking precautions not to inhale the fumes or the paint dust. I would recommend wearing a mask or respirator of some sort, which you should have anyway, as you should not be leaving your home without a mask. After your first few coats, you might have a few little tough places that haven't been hit by the wider spray, in which case you can go a little bit closer and get a bit of paint on those little spots on the model, but just be careful not to do too thick of a coat on your models. Once you're done, you're going to want to let the black primer dry for about 15 to 30 minutes. After that, we're ready to spray on our white highlight. 
Because we're using our white primer to simulate natural light hitting the model from above, we want to make sure we are only spraying above the model in about a 75 degree cone. Spray this lightly, about a foot away from the model, using as many light coats as you need in order to achieve a result that looks something like this. This technique may take some practice to get right. The effect that we're going for is to have the highest surfaces being fully white and the most recessed surfaces and the lowest surfaces fully black, with many surfaces in between falling somewhere on the gray spectrum. As you can see here, I have not achieved perfect results this time and you probably haven't either, and that's okay. I would encourage you not to worry about this because perfection is impossible and the pursuit of it is the path to hell. And also, we're going to be doing some touch-ups at the next stage anyway, so don't worry about it. Now that we're back at our desk, I'm going to go through a few basic brush techniques. I'm going to show you a few different ways that we're going to use each of our paints and each of our brushes. and. I'm going to be showing you how I use these for underpainting the models, but all these techniques are also going to be applicable to all the other painting you're going to do going forward. So these are going to be sort of the fundamentals of how we put paint on a brush and then how we put the brush on the model. The reason we're doing it this way, you may not you may not need to thoroughly underpaint your model every time, but I think that painting in just black and white to start with is really going to help to uh, practice your fundamentals because you don't have to think about any sort of color or anything like that. Once you've mastered the fundamentals of black and white, it's a lot easier to move into adding adding in some color to that equation. Let's go through a few of the supplies we have here on the desk. We have our two paint colors, which I'm going to go through as we take them out of the bottles. We have our jam jar full of water. I like to use a jar that's sort of shaped like this because it's less likely to tip over than something taller. Uh, we have our models, which we uh, Zenithal primed. We have a selection of brushes. This is, you probably do not need this many brushes. I'm gonna go through how we're gonna use these brushes and what they're for in the next part. But uh, I bought these for around $10, like $14 Canadian, but $10 USD. So uh, you, you probably only need about three of these, and I'm going to go through which ones in a second. So you could probably get your brushes for even cheaper if you could find a smaller pack like this. Uh, we also have a paper towel. You only need really about this much for what we're going to do. And then I have the top of a takeout container, which we're going to use for our palette. We're going to go through one model at a time, and I think I'm going to use this model as our demonstration model because I think she's the most interesting. So we're going to set the other two models aside for now. Using some poster putty, I'm going to stick her on this piece of wood. If you don't have uh, a piece of wood that's this shape, you could use a dowel that you cut, or you could use a pill bottle or an old paint bottle. It just helps when handling. It's going to help you not get your fingerprints on the model to have your model mounted on something instead of just holding the base. So let's open up these brushes and we'll go through what each of them are going to get used for. Now these are not fancy brushes. These are just like middle of the line probably like just above dollar store brushes. I bought them on Amazon. I have an affiliate link down below to um, where you can buy them. So to simplify out of that package, these are the brushes I recommend you get. A mixing brush, a moderately fine detail brush. Actually, let me see if this will work for a fine. <laughs> Once it's wet, we can kind of see. Yep, that'll work. Anything um, where you can get kind of a fine point is going to work. 
Uh, you could also use a smaller brush or a slightly larger brush, but what's important is the the point and that it's fairly long so that our paint doesn't get up in the, the ferrule, which will ruin our brush. I've also advised you to buy these cheap brushes because inevitably when you're starting out, you're probably going to ruin these brushes and I want to give you permission to ruin these brushes. Eventually, I'm going to recommend that you buy a nicer brush, but we will get to that in class three or four. I haven't decided yet. Enough of all this preparation. Let's start messing around with paint. Before we put anything on the model, I'm going to just like show you some of the paint and how it works and why I recommended these two paints as your starting paint. So this is what your typical hobby paint is going to look like when you buy it. I'm recommending you use hobby paints versus a more traditional artist paint, mostly because of the size of the pigment. If you put this onto your model, it's going to be a bit too chunky. Now, artist paints do have their applications in miniature painting, and we might eventually get into that. But for now, I'm going to recommend that you use something specifically formulated for hobby purposes. You can buy most of these colors for around $3, which I think is a pretty good price. And you can also buy them in packs of 12 or something for a bit cheaper. So in each of these classes, I'm going to recommend a few more colors in this line that you can buy. This is uh, called Viejo Model Color, and that is... Um, Viejo is the, the brand and model color is kind of one of their lines of paint. There's a couple other, if you can't find this exact color, don't worry about it. Um, what we're looking for is just a, a slightly off white. So any, any kind of brand will work. If you can't find Viejo paints in your area, you could always go with Army Painter. This is maybe a bit too dark for what we're looking for, but I'm pretty sure Army Painter also has a compatible color. Let me take a look at what's in here. Yeah, that's a bit too dark, but I'm sure they do have, um, they probably have a color that's similar to Pale Sand all listed in the description. Or you could also go with Games Workshop, um, which are kind of the lowest value paints. I would recommend these last over out of all three of these paints. Army Painter and Viejo are about the same quality. Um, I find Games Workshop paints are a bit um, different in formulation. They're a bit thicker, but if all you have is Citadel paints in your area, you could go with um, these paints. And I'll list uh, compatible color down in the description. The reason that I'm not recommending that you use pure white in your painting is for one very simple reason. That most pure white paints are... chalky as hell. So if you look at this paint, probably be putting this on my palette instead of my hand. It's extremely chalky and hard to hard to work with. And that's because it's uh, the the closer your color is to pure white, the more I think it's the more white pigment that you use, the chalkier it's going to be basically. So I find that a slightly off white paint just flows a little bit better. So you can see, like, it's a lot more, um, it's easier to blend with, and it just flows better. I look like I'm doing a makeup tutorial right now. So yeah, my favorite version of an off-white that's still an extremely bright color is uh, Viejo Pale Sand. So that's the one I would go with, but if you can't find it, there are similar colors, I'm sure. Um, even in this range, there are a lot of off-white colors you could use. All right, so moving forward, let's talk about the different ways you can use these paints. So before using them, you're going to want to shake it 
fairly um, well before you use it. And when you put it on your palette, you're just going to use a single drop. One of the nice things about dropper bottles is you can put paint out a drop at a time. So it makes it very easy to measure out mixtures. So you could say like two drops of this to one drop of that and it's easy to remember what your mixtures are like. So I just put down two drops of this paint. This bottle will actually last you for a very long time because we're only using a very small amount each time. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to use these colors. So when paints, paint comes right out of the bottle, it's going to be fairly thick. And for most purposes, this is actually too thick to put on the model. So what I like to do is take a drop or two of water and thin the paint down a little bit. Need one more drop. So when we're painting, this is about the consistency that I would work with. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to add more water. To the point where it's starting to run. That's too much. At that point, you've thinned it too much and it's going to dry in sort of a coffee stain kind of way. And it'll also just take longer to, to, you'll have to apply more coats. We want to use the thinnest coats possible because we don't want to be able to see the brush strokes or the texture of the paint. We just want it to look like, um, all, like all the details are preserved and they are just colored the color we want them to be. Okay. So, we're just going to put this to the side of our palette and ignore it because we thinned it too much for demonstration purposes. And I'm just going to show you one other thing, which is how I wash my brush when I'm done. So you never want your brush to be covered in paint for too long. And the reason I have my paper towel here is so that I can quickly dry my brush off. Uh, what I used to do is just have this somewhere on my desk and I would dry it off like like this, but it's much quicker to just have it kind of here as almost a, a contrast to your palette. So it's very quick and easy to dry off your paints. So now that we've seen how the paint flows on the palette, I'm going to show you the first way that we can apply paint to the model. And the first thing we're going to do is a technique that is called... I have accidentally used the... This was the brush I was going to use for dry brushing, but now it's all wet. I meant to use this as our mixing brush, but I used this instead. So I'm going to select a different brush to use for our dry brushing. Um, yeah, this will work. Okay, so this is going to be our new dry brushing brush. Basically what you want for dry brushing is a kind of wide flat brush or if you have any old makeup brushes these work really well too for dry brushing and they're also fairly cheap too you can buy a makeup brush at the dollar store for like a dollar usually because they don't need to be nice ones they can be cheap ones okay so this is going to be our dry brush so dry brushing is when we use very dry paint which is the opposite of what I just showed you. So we're just going to put some paint over here on our palette. We're not going to thin it at all. 
and we're just going to take a little bit of it on the tip of our brush and then what we're going to do is we're going to just remove almost all of the paint from our brush and we can test it out on our thumb So that's about the right amount. We don't we don't want it to be we don't want to have too much of it come off there. And then we're going to use it to highlight the details on the model by running it over top of it. And the paint is just going to catch on the raised surfaces and highlight them. It may take a while. It's a very subtle effect, but over enough coats of this, you're going to see results. In general, the less paint that you use for this, and the longer that you take, the better your results are going to be. So you can kind of see that our highlights are just clinging to the most raised surfaces on the model. We're just going very gently. So this is a really quick and easy way to get some highlights on your model. And just to bring out some of that some of the work that's already been done by our Zenith All Highlight. We just want to hit the surfaces that the sun would hit. So you can see from far away the difference that makes compared to the initial um, Zenith All. So we're just going to go over the whole model with this. And the softer your brush is, the better this effect is going to work. So I'm just going to compare this to one of our other models and you can sort of see the, um, you can see the difference between the initial spray and uh, kind of bringing out the highlights. I like to do this with any model just starting out. It's, an, it's a great way to map out where you want to have your highlights. You can go as slow or as fast as you want, but generally the slower you go, the better your results are going to be. You can even do this on the base to bring out some of that texture. So we can spend as much time or as little time on this process as we want. The longer you spend on it, the more of these natural highlights you can bring out in the model. It's one of the many ways that the model is kind of telling you where the highlights should be. One of the philosophies that I have about painting miniatures is like the miniatures are kind of They'll tell you where you should put the highlights and the shadows if you kind of pay attention, just with the texture kind of wants you to paint it a certain way. Okay, so that's probably enough dry brushing for now. We might come back to do a little bit more after the next step. So our next step is going to be the opposite of dry brushing, which is washes. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about washes and the sort of paint that we're going to use for washes. So this is a paint from a paint line called Citadel Shades. We're going to take a little bit out and I'm going to show you what it looks like on the palette. So it is kind of a naturally thin paint that sticks to the crevices. of a surface. So unlike just normal thinned paint, normal thinned paint dries in kind of a, you can kind of see how it's drying right there, an uneven way because the molecular structure is broken down or something. But these paints are specifically formulated to be thinner than normal paints and to cling to the deepest recesses of a model. Uh, yeah, so we're going to use this to add some shadows to our model. So this is the first time when I'm going to be using our good brush, our nice brush, whatever you want to call it. We want to be using a brush with a fairly good point for this step. So like our other paint, we're going to want to shake this up quite a bit before we use it. And then unlike the other paint, I don't like to bother with a palette for this. I like to use it right out of the pot. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to take a little bit of it, taking care not to get the paint in the, the ferrule of the brush. We just want it to be on the tip of the brush. If your paint gets down here, it's gonna ruin your brush's tip. So we just want to put a little bit like this on our brush. And then we can wipe off some of the excess. Oh. Yeah. This brush hasn't been used before, so it's a bit stiff. So we just want to take a little bit onto our brush. And then we're going to put it into the deepest crevices of our model. So like any of these little creases we can darken with this shade. And you can kind of see the the zenithal highlight is provided a nice map of where our shadows should be. We're just going to go through and highlight, or not highlight, but we're going to go through and emphasize those shadows. If you were in a hurry, you could just run this paint all over the model and that would probably work too, but since we have the time, I'm going to recommend that you take your time and just put this paint into the deep crevices where you want to have it. You also want to clean off your brush fairly regularly. can see this paint is really good at bringing out the details. You could also do this step before the dry brushing step if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter what order you do it in. I just find doing the dry brushing first um, and then applying the wash. The wash tends to de-emphasize some of the chalkiness of the dry brush. But yeah, you can kind of see what this is doing. It's just sinking into the deep recesses of the model and helping the highlights stand out. The key to any model looking good is a lot of contrast, a lot of really dark blacks and bright whites. So you can kind of see right there how this is working. This paint naturally wants to sink into these crevices. And don't worry if you go overboard and add too much. 
you can always return and add some more highlights with the dry brush. But generally, we just want to hit up these deepest areas. And any area with a lot of texture that that um, is going to accept the wash in a way like that. We will put some deep in here. Anywhere that would be deep in shadow. We want to hit with some of this wash. It really helps these creases stand out, I find. You can even add multiple layers if you want to really darken some areas like the shadow under the eyes. And if you put too much, all you have to do is clean off your brush and just put your brush here and it will suck up the excess. Or it should. This is a cheap brush, so it's not doing it very well, but you can kind of remove the excess like that. And you can start to see the model coming together. If you compare these two models, you can sort of see the difference. We're just refining all of the details, helping everything stand out as we go. This is what your model's going to look like once it's had a little bit of time to dry. As you can see, we've got a lot more refined shadows than our original starting model. This gives us some nice um, lines to color within. A lot of these dark black shadows will still be present on our final model. It almost makes our model like a coloring book. We can see where the edges of each of the surfaces is. So in class 103, we're going to be taking this model and we're going to go, we're going to take it all the way to this level of color and highlight. So there's still some things we can do to prepare for color. As you can see, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the surfaces here are cream colored. So we can go ahead and start painting those on and highlighting them. And also a lot of the armor is very bright in terms of highlights. So we could probably start highlighting that on here too. Generally, we want to start matching the tones of anything we can at this stage before we put the color on because it's very hard to get these sorts of vibrant colors if you don't have a nice undercoat of uh, white or, in our case, pale sand. So this is our goal to get to and we can probably highlight a little bit more. This is what I would usually do. I would try to add the highlights so that they match the colors, so they match the tones of the final model. So with this as our guide, our final model as our guide, I'm going to go in and start highlighting the cloth parts of the model. We want to make sure to shake up our pale sand nice and good. And then we're going to put a few drops of it onto our palette.
and using our mixing brush, we're going to take a little bit of water and thin down the paint slightly. Not too much, but about, about like that, where it's going to run a little bit, but it's not going to run completely down the palette. The way that I like to paint is to take just a little bit on the tip of my brush, and then you want to press it against your paper towel gently, and a lot of the really excess moisture is going to get removed. just so it doesn't flood onto the model. So we just want, yeah, something like that kind of texture. Don't want too much paint on our brush, otherwise it's just gonna flood onto the model in ways that we don't want it to. So let's start by just highlighting some of these parts of the robes. So we know these are gonna be fairly bright, so we can probably just go all the way over it. And brighten them up. Do the same thing over here. And then the same thing right here. So you can see we've left the darkest part the way it is. So we want to maintain those shadows and then you can get a little bit more paint. Do the same thing, wipe off the excess. We can start painting the upper robes. You can see we're just using our paint on the most raised surfaces, leaving lots of shadows. And because we did a lot of underpainting, we can see where those shadows would naturally fall. Thanks to our Zenithal highlight, those parts are already dark. So it's just a matter of highlighting the parts that are already light in color. As you can see here, I have a bit of excess paint in a place that I don't want it, so I'm going to quickly take all the paint off my brush, and then I'm going to use my empty brush to just go in brush needs to be dry in order to do this, just go in and uh, remove it. There we go. If we had a higher quality brush, I'm used to using a higher quality brush that would just suck it up, but these brushes are uh, not as high quality. Okay, so uh, these parts, the interiors of these robes are also going to be white, so we can highlight this part here too. Again, we're just going to do the same thing as before. Some paint from our palette, wiping it off. And then we're going to go in here, and we can really highlight this area nice and bright. Leaving some room for the shadow. And making sure not to get our paint in these little buttonholes or whatever these are. This is why I like to do um, our washes early on. So all of those really deep crevices are already shadowed. Okay, and you can see the difference. So our model's starting to come together. You can highlight this surface here as well.
So again, we're just building up these gradual layers. Slow and steady. Slowly brightening up all the parts of the model. It helps to have one figure as your test figure that you know you're trying to achieve and you can just match it. So as you can see, we have a, a ways to go. We can probably do some more highlighting. Uh, but also, these pauldrons need to be white, although they're pretty bright already. We might not need to highlight those. Or we could highlight the... Uh, we could highlight these parts white. Let's go ahead and do that. Same process every time. Take a little bit of paint on your brush, wipe off the excess, and then just carefully put a little bit of paint onto your model. It's always better to put less on than you need to and then have to put on more later than to put on too much and have it flood the model. And because we're using such thin layers of paint, it's not going to build up too much um, unwanted texture. Okay. So I think we could probably use a little bit more highlights on the front here. With every thin layer that we add, we're making it a little bit brighter. It's the nice thing about using lots of thin layers. I actually think this paint might be a little bit too thin. It's a little bit runny, so I might actually want to add a little bit more paint to our paint-to-water mixture. Yeah, I'm just going to add a little bit more pale sand to our mixture because I feel like it's getting a little bit runny and there's a risk of it running into the dark surfaces that we don't want to have paint in them. This will just thicken up the mixture a little bit. We could probably start highlighting some of the areas that are going to be blue because we want those areas to be fairly bright. Like this part could be a bit brighter. Okay. So now we might do a little bit of edge highlighting. So the way we're going to do that is the same way we were doing before. We're just going to take a little bit of paint, wipe off the excess, and we're just going to use the, let's say we want to highlight the edge of this here. We're just going to use the side of our brush. Oh, that paint is too wet. <laughs> It's a fine balance. As you continue to work with the paint, you'll start to get to know how wet you need it. Okay, so let's try that again. So we're just going to take the edge of our brush and gently run it along here. And highlight the edges. 
can do the same thing on the edge of the armor here. This is a pretty quick way to highlight some of the edges on your model. It's a subtle effect, but very effective. Could use it on this edge here. Because generally the edges, uh, those sharp edges are going to be the brightest. So it helps them stand out. Just using the edge of our brush. We might want to do some work on the shield because I think we want we want this scroll part to be white so we could paint that. You can really go as far as you want at this stage. You don't need to spend too much time on these extra highlights before you go to color, but it's really, you can go as far as you want. I like to highlight as much as I can in black and white up front before I add any color to the model. You can sort of see how I use my brush to just hit the edges of this. We might also want to punch up the highlights on the rosary or whatever you want to call those beads so they're kind of an ideal candidate for edge highlighting be a good exercise for your detail painting we'll just use the edge of our brush just paint each one carefully Go over a few of them several times. A lot of the work has been done for us already with our dry brushing and wash. It's a lot of little details like that that can help the model really stand out. Also realizing I want to highlight this a bit more. The nice thing about working in this way is that you can sort of see the whole model and what we're doing is just going over it and saying like, oh, which part looks unfinished? And we're gradually refining the entire model rather than just working on one section at a time. I think that's the best way to work. Then you're, again, you're always, you will always have a complete model if you work in that fashion. I think this crystal is going to be pretty bright. So we might go in and highlight that crystal. Really help it stand out. This is a great way to practice your brushwork because a lot of this stuff you can refine at a later stage. So if you mess up, you can always refine it when we add color. It 
it's good to take this sort of practice at whatever stage you can get it. And I think often it's tempting to have the goal of painting be to finish models, but I think it can be equally as satisfying for the goal to be to get in as many practice hours as you can. Because by having that as your goal, you're also going to finish a lot of models. <laughs> but by pursuing practice instead of pursuing finished models, uh, you're going to enjoy the time more and it'll feel less like work. If you can just enjoy little things like this gradually refining a model it can be a very peaceful exercise. You could stop here and start adding color or you can keep going like I'm doing. Adding further highlights. The more highlights you add, the stronger your contrast will be in the final product. It's important not to get too bogged down in this stage, like I'm going a bit slower than I usually would for demonstration purposes. But uh, yeah. Painting in black and white can be a great way to hone your skills because you don't really have to think about anything else. Just light and shadow. This shield part here is going to be blue, so I'm going to brighten it up a little bit. back of the model could probably use. I, I find often I, I tend to neglect the back of the model. It's a weird instinct, but I tend to focus on just the front. So let's, uh, let's see if there's anything on the back that we could add a little bit more highlights to. This pauldron is going to be gold, so it's great to add some extra highlights before we add the gold part on top. And this is going to be pale sand. This will be white, so we can add a little bit more white to that. Could highlight the edge of the weapon will be silver, but it never hurts to add the highlights ahead of time. Again, it's less work for you later. If I was painting a whole bunch of these at once, I would probably set a timer for I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes so that I don't spend too much time on this phase. You don't want to get too bogged down in the underpainting phase. But because we're just painting these few models, we can spend as much time here as we want. Gradually highlighting things. I'm 
and any sort of raised surface is going to be brighter than anything that the light is not hitting. So these parts of her robes can be brighter. So this is looking pretty good. I think we can probably stop here for now. Our next stage is going to be to take this model and turn it into this, which seems like a huge step, but because we've done a lot of the work ahead of time, it's actually not as big of a step as you might think. Because we've already established all the shadows and highlights. So in our next class, that's what we're going to be doing. Take this all the way to this. Today we learned how to Zenithal prime our models, how to highlight our models using dry brushing, how to use washes to apply some basic shadows, and some other basic brush techniques for putting paint onto our models, such as edge highlighting. These are the absolute fundamentals of how to use our brush and how to work with paint, and in the future, all of our other lessons are just going to be variants and advanced techniques that are building upon these few basic techniques. In our next class, we're going to be learning several techniques to apply color to our models, and we're also going to be finishing up our first set of models. In order to do that, you're going to need the following supplies in addition to everything we used this week. Your homework for today is to completely prime and underpaint your first three Stormcast models to the best of your ability, using the techniques that we outlined in this video. Before we go, I'd like to extend a huge thank you today to all of our supporters on Patreon. I quite simply could not afford to be making these videos without your support at this point. If you'd like to see your name up here, or if you'd like to see an extended, more in-depth version of this class, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Dana Howell. Or you can follow my painting progress on Twitter or Instagram at Dana underscore Howell. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in our next class when we're going to learn all about applying color to our models.